streets, right? Well, actually, I got on the streets and I spent a night like a homeless person. And <laughs> <laughs> scared the living daylight. So you'll, you can do a class on that and tell us all about it. Um, actually, I, I do plan to write a little essay about it. Sure. Uh, part of several essays, actually, uh, dealing with, you know, I do these essays on history in small, uh, small places. And part of what I was doing was it's a it's a trail that starts actually just outside of St. Louis. Now, I didn't start there um, and runs for 216 miles, an old railroad track that's converted into a trail. Uh, and I did about 40 miles of it. And uh, to celebrate a great deal of weight loss and getting some of my physical health back. And then I almost, I mean, my, my kids thought I'd had a heart attack and I was laying in a ditch and I don't blame them. I yeah, mean, sure. I was just out of communication. Bishop, where are we standing on the we, we are ready to start. Um, I'm going to uh, welcome everybody. Thank you all for coming and joining us today for our number four lecture in part two of the American Civil War. Uh, Dr. Fred Bailey uh, is here with us and we would like I would like to let you know that we will be muting everybody and hopefully we'll have time for questions and answers after the presentation. Um, if you have a question, you don't wanna forget it, uh, type it in the chat box and we'll get to it when, when we uh, have time for questions. Um, I am going to turn it over to Fred and I am going to to mute everybody else, so don't be offended. <laughs> take it away, Fred. Okay. <clears throat> you, had, you said take away just at the moment when I had to grunt. But then, <laughs> but then believe it or not, uh, one of the things that makes you a college professor is you grunt a lot. Good afternoon, everybody. It, uh, it is a privilege to, to be able to do what I'm doing right now and to share with everyone. I mentioned a moment ago in our general conversation, just a polite conversation, that I have been interested in the American Civil War ever since I was 13 years old. I was 13 years old in 1960, and that's when the Civil War centennial began. And so as a young and, and quite admittedly uh, Southern born boy, um, the Civil War became absolutely fascinating to me. Now I'll grant you over the years, the form of that fascination has taken a different style. Uh, the Apostle Paul once said that uh, when I was a child, I acted as a child, I did as a child. And then when I became a man, I put away childish things. And so my approach to the American Civil War in the year 2020 is radically different from my approach to the Civil War in 1960. So that was, uh, that was 60 years ago, it's amazing. At any rate, um, a lot of what I like to do in dealing with history in general and with the Civil War in particular is to get in a sense of, of the spirit, what uh, uh, we historians, when we like to use big words, call the zeitgeist, that's a German term, which means um, ghost spirit or spirit of the time and um, a time spirit or time ghost, so spirit of the time. And uh, the zeitgeist means what, what's going on? What's the attitude? How do people feel? And because the way we feel often overwhelms the whole sense of uh, uh, ration and the whole sense of uh, what's going on. And so it's time to, to begin that war and to see what's going on, both rationally to see what's going on and also to feel what's going on. In the course of this lecture, uh, the sharing that we have, uh, there is basically, I try to do three parts and essentially the three parts are going to be, there's gotta be a plan. I mean, we're fixing to, to kick off a major event fighting the American Civil War. And whenever we do something major, we plan out for all the occasions and, and the plans may not work out the way we want them to, but almost always we have a plan. And then secondly, because it's going to be a war, there's gotta be a military. 
And that means that both the North and the South are gonna to have to create incredibly large armies, which the American people had never done before. Nothing like this had happened in North America and uh, uh, very rarely in the New World. Uh, in fact, not at all in the New World up to this point. Now later in South America, there's actually going to be a war that will far exceed in terms of numbers and casualties uh, the American Civil War that we almost never talk about, but it involves Paraguay and uh, Brazil and Uruguay and Argentina, but uh, that's not the purpose of this lecture. So we've got to have a military to pursue the goals of the American Civil War. And when you have a military, ultimately there is a clamor for a battle and there's going to be a battle. And that of course is the battle of first bull run, if you use the Northern term, or the battle of uh, Manassas, as you use the Confederate term. Uh, a little aside, next lecture, we're going to have a lecture in which I explain a lot of things like why battles were named differently, North and South and a few other things, but, uh, but that's for the next lecture. So there's gotta be a plan, there's gotta be a military, and there's got to be a battle. There's got to be a plan. In other words, the war is coming and no one has prepared for the war, at least for the most part. And, uh, and you have uh, two presidents of the United States, Abraham Lincoln is president of the United States. And then of course the Confederate States of America will be Jefferson Davis. Um, of the two, the better person in terms of being familiar with the military is Jefferson Davis, no question about it. And again, we're gonna talk about Jefferson Davis and Lincoln and do a comparison in our next lecture. But uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln is uh, completely green. He, he comes onto the scene and um, he needs to have a plan. So what do you do when you need to have a plan? And the answer is you seek an expert. And that expert is gonna be Winfield Scott, who is the uh, commander in chief, not the commander in chief, but the commander of uh, the American military forces on the eve of the American Civil War. Commander in Chief, of course, is always the President of the United States. But before we look at Lincoln, uh, let's start with a brief statement about uh, the Confederate States of America. And uh, one of the failings or flaws, might be a better way of saying, of the Confederate States of America is that uh, during the course of the American Civil War, they never settled on a consistent plan or a consistent doctrine of how to fight the war. In dealing with the military, the term doctrine means the, the way in which you're going to pursue something. What is your doctrine? What, did, what are you going to do in certain situations? And in the case of the Confederate States of America, even though they had a leader who had once been Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis, and they had a leader who had participated um, in war, the Mexican War, as an officer, Jefferson Davis, and who was a West Point graduate, Jefferson Davis. At the same time, uh, Davis never settled, uh, never got his command structure to settle on a specific plan to pursue uh, victory. And that's going to be one of the, the flaws. It doesn't mean the South could have was absolutely going to lose because of that, but that's going to be a disadvantage that the South will have. It does not have a doctrine for how we're going to win the war. Broadly speaking, the South kind of divided its attitude into two parts. One part would be represented by Robert E. Lee, and that's the idea that they would form, in terms of its military, a bold and aggressive offense as the path to victory. Uh, that's what Lee did. Lee, by nature, did his best when he, uh, when he was on the offense. In fact, one of his quotations, this is after the war was over with, but, uh, and he was defending what he had done, but I think it's a, a, a very correct statement. He said, I was too weak to defend, so I attacked. Now, that sounds like a, a weird way of doing it, but actually has merit. Whenever a weaker opponent knows that it, um, it, it will have trouble in the long run, the best thing the weaker opponent can do is to go in and hit as hard as possible, 
hoping to get a knockout blow. And if you get that knockout blow, the other side becomes discouraged and defeated. And that was a potential form of success. Now, the problem with, uh, with Lee's approach ultimately would be that uh, uh, in time, the Confederacy could not support the kind of uh, aggressive action that he was taking. In fact, in the end, uh, a lot of people don't realize this, but you've heard the term Butcher Grant, uh, that Ulysses S. Grant seemed to be by 1864, um, having prodigious losses, uh, massive losses of people, so that, uh, that the Union casualties were so high, people began to call Grant a butcher. The truth of the matter is, uh, if you look at Robert E. Lee's actions in the early part of the war when he was most aggressive, uh, in each series of battles he fought, he lost more men than the Union did because that's what happens when you go on the offense. But if that offense can win, hit hard and win, and thus discourage the other side, that could have been a, a viable option, but it was not an option that was consistently followed across the Confederacy. And incidentally, Jefferson Davis favored the idea of being aggressive, even when it was obvious to, to many people, certainly to historians, that the South had lost the ability to have that kind of aggression. On the other hand, the other policy that was being promoted was basically the policy promoted by uh, Joseph E. Johnston. Johnston was uh, probably second only to Lee in terms of important Confederate generals, but uh, for a wide variety of reasons, which we'll again talk about next week when I review Johnston, um, Johnston and Jefferson Davis didn't get along. Uh, Johnston uh, had a personality where he was, uh, how shall I say it, very much conscious of his, um, what's the word I'm looking for? His, uh, well, his being, his ego. And uh, uh, he always felt like he was being slighted by Jefferson Davis. And come to think of it, he was correct. He was being slighted by Jefferson Davis. Davis did not like Joseph E. Johnson's position, which was basically uh, the same position taken by George Washington during the American Revolution, which was keep your army intact, keep your forces in the field, and wear down the enemy till the enemy basically loses public support. That's how we won the American Revolution. Much later, that's how the, the Vietnamese won uh, you know, our, our war in Vietnam. We Americans clearly were defeated but we were defeated because we lost public support. And um, in the case of the American Revolution, the British quit supporting the war. And so Johnson's position was, we don't have the power to, uh, to slug it out one-on-one -on -one with the North. So fight essentially a war that keeps our forces in the field, that's basically defensive, and uh, we might lose some territory, but in the end, we're gonna wear down the North and we will be victorious. And it's a position by 1864 that almost was successful, but it was a position that did not appeal to the aggressive mindedness of Jefferson Davis, whereas Robert E. Lee's aggressiveness did appeal to Jefferson Davis. And there would be this, again, inconsistency on the part of Confederacy. Never did it develop a consistent um, mechanism by which it would pursue single-mindedly a path that hopefully would lead to success. By contrast, uh, the United States had several advantages in the war, but at the opening of the war, one of its biggest advantages was a person and a plan, a person and a plan. The person was of course, Winfield Scott, uh, Lieutenant General Brevet. I want to uh, notice the word brevet. I'll explain that word in a moment. But Lieutenant General Bre Brevet uh, of the United States military. And of course, he is the highest ranking member of the military, and he is the person in charge of the American military. In fact, uh, his entire career lasted 53 years, going all the way back to, the, uh, to before the War of 1812. 
And for 20 of those years, he was the head of the American military, longer than any other individual. Um, so what does the term prevent mean? The only other person to hold the rank of Lieutenant General in the American military prior to Winfield Scott was a fellow by the name of George Washington. Uh, intentionally, that rank, which in European terms would be the equivalent of a marshal, uh, for reasons we Americans did not adopt certain European terms, and we never adopted the term marshal, which is the highest rank that you can have in the European military. But Lieutenant General in America, five stars, would be the marshal rank. In fact, in World War II, when, uh, when the Soviets and the English began to have generals that were marshals, people like Eisenhower and Patton and Bradley and Mac uh, MacArthur were all given the rank of Lieutenant General so that they would have the equivalent rank of a Russian marshal or a British marshal, or for that matter, a German marshal, the highest rank available. Now, what does the word brevet mean? Brevet means honorary, honorary. In other words, his real rank at that point in time, Winfield Scott's real rank was major general. But, uh, but in order to honor people, like today we would give campaign ribbons, uh, often people held a brevet rank, which means uh, they got the honor of the rank. Uh, they were briefly given the power of the rank, but ultimately it was not going to be a permanent thing. And so in the American Civil War, you have a lot of people who become a brevet general, for example, brigadier general or any other rank. And, uh, but that brevet means that's the honorary rank, but their real rank, especially once the war is over with, will fall backwards. One quick example, uh, Custer. George Custer became the youngest general in the American, Revo uh, American Civil War. At the age of 23, he was a general, but it was brevet. So he held the power of a general. Um, he held the honor of a general, but if he remained in the army, his rank was going to go backwards. In other words, when the war is over with, he would fall back to the rank that he had that was uh, the full rank. In the case of Custer, he goes all the way back from, um, uh, from a brevet brigadier general to a captain in the post-Civil War period, and then works his way back up to Colonel uh, by 1876, when his career was, unfortunately for him, cut rather short. So, um, uh, and we're quite familiar with the event that caused him to be, his career to be cut rather short. It's quite famous. So at any rate, we have an asset. Winfield Scott is not only a man who has a great deal of military experience, but even Europeans had a great deal of respect for him. The United States did not have a general staff. That's something the Prussians were beginning to develop in, in, uh, in Europe at that point in time. But for all practical purposes, the United States had a general staff in one man. And that one man was Winfield Scott. And Winfield Scott will come up with what is called the Anaconda Plan. And the Anaconda Plan will basically be the outline of the strategy, the outline of the doctrine, the outline of the process that will lead ultimately to a Union victory. So uh, let's talk about Winfield Scott and that victory. You've probably heard of uh, Arthur Weasley, Wesley, but not Weasley, Weasley has to do with uh, some fiction and uh, Harry Potter novels. Wesley, all Arthur Wellesley, uh, the Duke of Wellington, the victor, the English victor at, uh, um, at Waterloo back in 1815, highly respected military person, always asked to, to comment on uh, the militaries of various countries. And in 1847, uh, this highly respected military theorist in England observed Winfield Scott's masterful campaign uh, as he marched from uh, Veracruz in Mexico to the capture of Me Mexico City during the, the United States-Mexican War. Um, 
And this British marshal, this British man of military letters basically said that it was one of the most brilliant campaigns he was ever familiar with. Today, we Americans hardly ever think about it, but if we were, if we were, uh, for lack of a better term, um, able to go back or to go to military academies where they're all over the world, the 1847 campaign of Winfield Scott in terms of bringing it into the Mexican war by marching across uh, the mountains from the east coast of Mexico to Mexico City by not only the military, but the political and the psychological activities that he engaged in, his military campaign is taught in every major military academy across the globe. It is uh, a, a marvelous example of doing the military exactly the way it should be. So you have in Winville Scott, a man of great intelligence who uh, in his position as the head of the military began to draw up a number of contingency plans for war. He had a contingency plan to invade Canada if it came to that. He had a contingency plan to invade Mexico to send the American military anywhere in the Caribbean. Any conceivable military situation that existed, he had a plan. And among his plans was, if it comes to a civil war and if the slave states depart, how could we defeat? How could we be victorious over the slave states? And in 1861, as he began to meet with Abraham Lincoln, he began to outline what that plan would be. And it was highly unpopular in its reception. But basically he said that uh, in a letter, for example, to George McClellan, who will replace him eventually as the head of the American military, he said, the object being clear to clear out and open a great riverine line of communication con uh, connecting with a uh, strict blockade of the seaboard as to envelop the insurgent states and bring them to terms with less bloodshed than any other plan. In other words, essentially his plan called for two things. It called for, first of all, a blockade, which incidentally, one of the first things Lincoln did was to proclaim a blockade of the South. And then secondly, for a campaign down the Mississippi River to split the slave states, and then to somehow tighten and constrict, hence the term, Anaconda Plan. By the way, George McClellan, when he was first placed with, they call it the Boer Constrictor Plan, but the term that, that fit was uh, um, the Anaconda Plan. But in its initial presentation, it was not well received in the North, nor was it well received by Abraham Lincoln. Why was it not well received initially? Well, first of all, it would take years to be effective. And in 1861, no one could conceive of a war that would last for years. It just uh, uh, didn't seem to be in the cards. It, it would be too expensive, too, uh, too deadly. And of course, Winfield Scott said we would need 60 to 80,000 troops to secure the Mississippi River. Now, ultimately, he was wrong. It took a whole lot more than 60 to 80,000 troops to secure the Mississippi River. But no one could conceive in the opening days of the American Civil War, uh, having an army of 60 to 80,000 people that would take years to accomplish uh, a bloody march north and south along the Mississippi River to, uh, to eliminate uh, uh, the insurgency, to put the insurgency to an end. And for that matter, the United States would need a river navy and it didn't have a river navy, not one warship, not one combat capable uh, uh, floating vessel uh, existed in the United States or the Confederacy. And so again, how can you put this plan into effect without first building a Navy, which takes months, if not years to do in the mind of people as they saw things in April of 1861. And of course, when it comes to blockading uh, the American South that goes all the way from basically uh, Maryland around to Texas, that's thousands of miles. 
And while the United States had a highly professional Navy, no question about it, the American Navy was um, for the most part modern and efficient, but it was very small. And being very small, um, there's no way that an effective blockade was conceivably possible in April of 1861. And again, it would take years and commitment to do that. And so initially Scott's plan was largely dismissed by the, uh, the contemporary thinkers of April 1861. And yet it will become the plan uh, that, uh, that will lead to uh, Union victory over the American South, but a victory that would take four long years and a bit more, four long years and a bit more. Instead, in the emotional atmosphere at the opening of the conflict in April of 1861, uh, there tended to be powerful voices saying, we want to get in there and we want to fight this thing and we want to get it over with in a hurry. And so there were very powerful voices. Some were politicians, some were newspaper editors, and we're going to look at, uh, at Horace Greeley and the New York Tribune in just a moment. Some were ministers, and uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, there was a proclamation, North and South alike, but especially in the North that said, um, the feeling was that basically a few hotheads had led the South out of the Union. That when you really get down to it, the, uh, the support for the Confederacy and the support for this insurrection uh, was believed to be a very thin veneer. So it was believed incorrectly that if you could just do a, a sharp, hard, uh, let me explain to you what things are about kind of battle or two, that the South would come to its senses and would, uh, would look for a compromise to bring everybody back into the Union and to restore peace. And that was the position taken by, uh, in particular, some of the more strident voices in the North. And for a long time, for at least half a decade, one of the most strident voices in the North was Horace, Horace Greeley. Uh, Horace Greeley and his newspaper, the New York Tribune, uh, was a powerful popular voice, not only as it related to anti-slavery, but encouraging people to move westward, uh, encouraging uh, social change, especially in the North. Uh, Horace Greeley was kind of, we don't have someone exactly like him today, but, but if you look at a Rush Limbaugh, who has a lot of popular support and a lot of people that don't like him, um, you've got Horace Greeley. Uh, Horace Greeley is much cut from the same manner. And so beginning in April and May of 1861, um, Greeley began to, to pound on a popular idea. No concession to traders, to Richmond, to Richmond onward. And you begin to have this, this pounding that, that we ought to just hit the South hard and that thin veneer of secessionist support will crumble and, um, and we'll begin the process of uh, picking up the pieces and restoring the union um, and, and ignore this idea, this foolish idea that we're gonna raise armies of 60 to 80,000 people and build a magnificent Navy, both for the Mississippi River and for the blockade and much more. Uh, all of that's gonna take years and, um, and money and effort and blood and that's not what this war is going to be about. On to Richmond. Let's get it over with in a hurry. Well, we'll see about that in a few minutes. But I think all of us know that in the end, uh, that idea of on to Richmond, that idea that um, um, you, you have a sudden blow against the Confederacy and it will collapse, uh, that idea led to the first battle of Bull Run and the Confederacy didn't collapse. So that as sober minded people began to look at the long term of the war and as the months passed, 
by the spring of 1862, um, the Anaconda plan began to mature. Now, by this time, Scott has retired. His health was bad, both his health in terms of his physical health and his political health. Um, and again, that's something we'll talk about in a little while. But, uh, but the Anaconda plan matured and essentially it does become the plan that is followed. All of the strange maneuvering that you see throughout the American Civil War, that uh, when you watch a documentary, you get a little piece here, or a little piece there, um, or you read an article about this battle or that battle. Well, the whole thing can be understood systematically if you understand the Anaconda Plan, which consisted of a blockade that by 1864, early 1864, became quite effective. But notice, it took until late 1863, early 1864, before this blockade became effective. But again, it is the plan. You start out with it, you build it, you make it work, and eventually, it does what it's supposed to do. It begins to strangle the Confederacy. And of course, splitting the Confederacy along the Mississippi and more importantly, opening the Mississippi as a line of communication. The Mississippi is critical to the North. We often think of the Mississippi as, as important to the South, but remember that Mississippi is critical to the North. Northern commerce went in two directions. If you're up around and say, um, the Great Lakes or in Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and you're trying to uh, uh, sell your products, you've got two choices. You can go eastward by way of the Great Lakes and the Erie Canal and down to New York City to market. Or you can go southward down the Mississippi to New Orleans to market. And of course, once you develop the Confederacy, the North has a major economic highway that uh, is cut off. So opening up the Mississippi is not, a, not only important for strangling the South, but it will be important for, for opening up the paths of, uh, of commerce for the North. And of course, that's part of the Anaconda plan to, to begin around Paducah, Kentucky and head southward and to capture New Orleans and head northward and eventually open up the Mississippi. It's part of that plan that ultimately was successful. And then added to that plan was the idea that once you've secured the Mississippi, you destroy the, the South's ability to make war. And the breadbasket of the South, where the South got most of its uh, food supplies, uh, was across uh, Alabama and Georgia and up through the Carolinas and then up through, uh, through North Carolina. And, uh, and so ultimately the third element of the Anaconda plan that when it matures, will be a campaign starting about Chattanooga, heading down to capture Atlanta, from Atlanta to the sea, and then march northward to, uh, to complete the destruction of the Confederate sources of supply to its armies in the field. And finally, of course, uh, because the capital will move from Montgomery, Alabama for the Confederacy to Richmond, um, there will be a constant series of campaigns designed either to capture Richmond or to protect Washington, D.C. These two capitals were 90 miles apart. And because they were 90 miles apart, it was to guarantee that uh, most, much of the significant fighting of the American Civil War will be fought over the possession of these two closely connected capitals. One more thing about Richmond, not only was it the Confederate capital, but uh, the South had very few powerful industrial places. And of course, Richmond, which is right on the border with the United States, was one of the major industrial war producing areas of the South, producing cannon, producing gunpowder. And so the fall of Richmond would not only be a political blow to the South, and not only would be a cultural blow to the South, but in terms of military importance, supplying the South's sinew for war, uh, the capture of Richmond would be significant. And ultimately, in April of 1865, Richmond will fall 
and for all practical purposes at that point, uh, the death knell of the Confederacy had occurred. So that's the Anaconda plan. But again, it's being presented in April of 1861. For the time period of this lecture, it's going to be rejected, but it will be the plan that will be consistently followed by the American North. And you can follow the battles and you can follow the campaigns. And uh, when you do that, you're largely following what's happening with this Anaconda plan that leads to a Northern success. Now, I'm gonna do something I will do every so often, which is have an interjection. And my purpose of this interjection is to really just read with you to share with you uh, some thoughts from a book written by, or not, not a book, it's a 10 volume biography of, of Abraham Lincoln, written by John G. Nicolay and John Hay. Um, Nicolay and Hay were Nixon's personal secretaries across the war. Uh, John G. Nicolay was his personal secretary and the younger man, John Hay, was the assistant secretary. Both men would go on, they were young men, to, to significant post-war careers in the, uh, in the government. In fact, eventually John Hay will become the American Secretary of State under William McKinley. And there's a famous treaty called the uh, hay boyna Barilla Treaty, which um, is signed in 1904. And it becomes the treaty by which the newly created Republic of Panama grants the United States the right to build a canal and sovereignty over that canal. But, uh, but that is a treaty that only simply fulfills many of the goals that the North had going into the American Civil War and in the process defeating the goals of the French and the British and also the Spanish to have control over one of the, check, uh, the uh, great checkpoints or block points of trade across the globe. But uh, John G. Nicolay and Hay, in the 1890s, produced uh, a fascinating 10-volume biography of, uh, of Abraham Lincoln. They were there. They, they were there when he made all of his decisions. They were there when there were minor squabbles between uh, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln and, uh, and servants. Uh, it is, for historians, uh, an incredible way of seeing the Lincoln administration from the inside. These were two insiders. Now, the interesting thing about their 10 volumes is that uh, for people who like Lincoln, uh, there's a massive amount of material. But for people who are enemies of Lincoln, and believe it or not, there are some people out there who are enemies of Lincoln to this day, uh, a number of things that... Uh, Nicolay and John Hay say can be used to, to, to say, wait a minute, Lincoln was kind of high handed in a lot of things. And the material I'm going to share with you is some of the material that uh, the people do. But uh, the material I'm going to share with you is a classic example of what happens when a leader is faced with a huge crisis that no one else has ever had to face before and how you do rather dramatic things that may or may not uh, actually be what you're allowed to do, but you do it because it's got to be done. And so to get the spirit, to get the zeitgeist, to get the feeling of the time, I'm just going to read a passage uh, from, uh, from volume four of, of their biography of Abraham Lincoln. And by the way, their language is, well, it's not the language of academia. It's not the cautious parsing of words that you'll find in academia. Um, if I say that their language is crude um, or vulgar, I'm not saying that there's evil words being said. I'm just saying that they, they speak the language of how people would speak. And so let's listen to what they say and get a sense of the crisis. You're trying to make decisions. Do you go with Winfield Scott and this complicated plan that's going to take building of navies and armies and, and, um, and months and years and millions upon millions upon millions of dollars? 
or do you listen to, to the on to Richmond, let's get it over with kind of situation? And they kind of explain the atmosphere, I think, very well. Here's what they say. Abraham Lincoln was absolutely inexperienced, the most woefully, woeful novice to occupy the White House in American history. But he held certain convictions, among them the indivisibility of the United States. His belief gave him enormous strength. Now, this is just what these men are saying. The Constitution is positively vague about the exact powers of the chief executive. Now, here I want to interject. What does the Constitution say about the military powers of the chief executive? Here it is. The president shall be the commander in chief of the Army and Navy of the United States and of the militia of the several states when called into the actual service of the United States. That is what the Constitution of the United States says. What kind of power does the president have at that point? To this day, I mean, quite literally, to this day, that has never been adequately defined. There is a constant struggle between Congress, which has the right to declare war, and the president, who is the commander in chief of the Army and Navy, over exactly what his power as commander in chief has and when it can be exercised and to what extent. And of course, in April of 1861, just like today, it had not been defined. So what happens? During this crisis with Congress, when Congress was not in session, he couldn't consult with Congress, it's not, not there. He had to act alone, often with little guidance, and he reveled uh, and he revealed an unexpected capacity for steely resolve. In other words, Hay and, uh, and Nicolay, they, they admired uh, what he did, whereas others could be very critical in hindsight to what he did. On April 20, remember uh, Fort Sumter is April 12, 13. On April 20, he authorized a raid on all important telegraph offices in the North and seize the wires. Now think about it. Uh, not too many years ago, the government of Russia was overthrown. The communist government of Russia was overthrown. What did Boris Yeltsin do who became uh, the outstanding leader in Russia at that time? The first thing he did was seize communications to, to cut off the rebels that had done that. Not very much long ago, there was a similar situation in Turkey. And it failed. It failed because the government in power seized communications and, uh, and was able to, to cut the rebels off from, uh, from doing things. Abraham Lincoln did the same thing. He didn't say, do I have the power to do it? Is it right for me to do it? Can I destroy freedom of speech and expression? He simply did it. And the next day, according to them, Lincoln removed vast sums from the treasury. And then he sent those sums to specific New York merchants to purchase items the federal government wanted, meaning war supplies. And all such activities, Nicolay admits, uh, were not only audacious, but illegal. In other words, he had no, no congressional authority to give him permission to do that, but he assumed it because he was the commander in chief of the army and navy which, by the way, is a very vague power, not specifically explained in the Constitution of the United States. And when he learned that Maryland's legislature was about to meet and might vote to secede, he told General Scott to keep an eye on the situation there. And if it looked as though the state body might in fact vote to join the Confederacy, Scott should use his army to close its doors and bombard uh, Baltimore's civilians into quiet quietude. Military law thus could replace civilian law in Maryland. And again, uh, there's a lot of questions which led to lawsuits, which were never resolved and still aren't resolved today. What power does the president have when the president is engaged in um, um, trying to, to deal with a crisis situation? And then finally, they observe, Abraham Lincoln often stomped, that's their word, not mine, but Abraham Lincoln often stomped upon his beloved constitution. But at this critical juncture of American history, he saved the country. 
It gets undeniable that during his four years in office, Abraham Lincoln produced an amazing litany of accomplishments, but his greatest shining moment came in the first few weeks of the Civil War. Now, in terms of leadership, when you're faced with a situation you've never been faced before, and Lincoln was faced with a situation no one had ever been faced before in the United States, you, you react to that crisis, and then only later do you ask, um, you know, did I really have authority to do that? And, uh, and historians are still debating today whether or not he had the authority to do it. But in the case of Nicolay and Hay, uh, both of these men who are admirers of Lincoln said that he was a man of action who did what was necessary to combat a crisis that developed. And in all likelihood, he did buy enough time by doing this, he bought enough time by doing this to, to stabilize the situation enough that, uh, that the North could begin to react to this great crisis of secession. So we are looking at the emotion. We are looking at the crisis of the period of time from roughly April 15 to July 21, 1861. On July 21, 1861 is when the Battle of Bull Run will be fought. And during this period of time, during this period of time, the, uh, the United States will quite literally, and the Confederate States of America, quite literally, and I chose this word intentionally, cobble together crude armies. Notice the word cobbled together. When you come cobble something together, it simply means that you're throwing it together because it's an emergency and, uh, and you hope the thing works. I'm gonna say that again, you cobble it together, it's an emergency and you hope, you hope, you hope that it works. So there's gotta be a military, there's gotta be a military. War has developed between the North and the South. Fort Sumter has been bombarded. There are riots in the streets in Baltimore there are armies being developed in the South and correspondingly, there has to be armies developed in the North, but both are throwing together armies very quickly and they're throwing it together with people who are not quite military ready. I'll say that again, not quite military ready. There are in cobbling together these armies three major elements to what was being cobbled together. The first was simply the regular United States Army. People are often surprised when I have less than a sterling opinion of one of our famous presidents of the United States whose face is carved on the Mount Rushmore, and that's Thomas Jefferson. But Thomas Jefferson, because of his fear and I think reasonable fear of a professional military um, created for the United States one of the worst military traditions that you could possibly imagine. Jefferson hated the professional military. Jefferson feared the professional military. And during his administration and the administration of his successor who felt the same way, James Madison, uh, basically, uh, they created a tradition that almost destroyed the American Navy, made sure that it would be very small. Now, it turned out to be very professional, but incredibly small. And they created an army that uh, was little more than a constabulary force. The idea being that you have a small, regular army, and at a time of crisis, you have the militia, and we'll talk about the militia in a moment, the militia, which can be quickly organized because they have training, and they're the ones that would fight the blunt of the war, uh, leading to ultimate victory in whatever major war we would have to fight. But in 1860 and 61, the United States had just over 16,000 regular army troops. And that's to deal with a country that was over 3,000 miles wide and roughly about, I'm sorry, 3,000 miles from the East Coast to the West Coast and roughly about 1,500 miles from the Gulf of Mexico 
up to the Canadian border. 16,000 plus regular troops, that's it. And about 1,400 officers. Now, when the war began um, and you looked at the officers' corps and it began to divide, um, most of the officers' corps remained with the North. Even many of the Southerners, among them Winfield Scott, for example, was a Southerner. In the Navy, Admiral Farragut was a Southerner born in Tennessee. Um, quite a number of the regular army um, uh, people, because they were regular army, their loyalty had always been to the United States, even if they were from the South, remained true. So of the roughly 1,400 um, officers in the American military, 1,100 remain loyal to the Union, but then 270 of the regular army officers uh, committed to the Confederacy. Now, to be sure, quite a number of those regular army officers that committed to the Confederacy became some of the more famous and some of the most successful, and in a few cases, some of the worst uh, generals of the Civil War. And, uh, but that would include, include people like Robert E. Lee, Joseph E. Johnston, uh, and when you're getting down to the worst, Braxton Bragg, and a few others. Now, what about the enlisted men? Over 15,000 men in the enlisted ranks. And the answer there is officers had the right to resign their commissions. Enlisted men did not. So if you were an enlisted man in the regular army, until your enlistment was up, you had to serve in the regular army for the United States. Now you could go AWOL, you could desert, and you could be executed. So, uh, so most of the regular army uh, continued to work and, and the regular army was very good. In fact, uh, many of these men served in the army of the Potomac and that gave the army of the Potomac an advantage because typically regular army regiments were held in reserve. And the reason they were held in reserve was that anytime there was a crisis, these were the best troops to be sent in to, uh, to, to reinforce a dangerous situation and to bring the crisis to an end. But in terms of building a military, there's not a great deal you can do with the kind of tiny military that the United States had. So instead, both the United States and the Confederate States of America would cobble together, would put together their armies using state militia, state militia, roughly the equivalent of the National Guard today, but nowhere near as well trained as the National Guard today. And the Constitution addresses a militia. The Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States reads as follows. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. The right of the people to bear arms shall not be infringed. And why are they not to be infringed? Because of the need for a well-regulated militia. And therein is the problem, well-regulated well-regulated. In the history of the United States, until you get to, well, some would argue the Vietnam War even, uh, the state militia uh, was never very well-regulated and never very well-trained. What would basically happen with these state militias is that four times a year, uh, each county would have a quarterly court day uh, quarterly courts. In other words, you've got a county seat and uh, four times a year, the commissioners of the county, whatever they were called, would meet to engage in whatever legal necessities were there. A circuit George judge would show up along with the circuit lawyers who would be accompanying him. And if there were any need for uh, trials, both civil trials and um, uh, personal trials, they, uh, they would engage for about uh, three days, depending on the size, maybe a week, but it would be a quarterly meeting of the court. 
And at the same time, since people are coming to the county court for that reason, there would also be a market. Um, if you needed to buy a horse or some mules, uh, this was the time to go there because uh, people would be bringing their horses and mules in to sell or to, to buy from uh, each other. And, um, and the local women would be, uh, have baked goods for people to eat and, um, and rooms would be let out to people who, who needed a place to stay during that period of time. And the local militia, a handful of local boys and men would come together and they would practice drill. In other words, they would practice lining up and marching and aiming their weapons. And um, it was a great show and the whole thing was a lot of fun. But in terms of uh, really being people who were hardened to the absolute necessities of how to fight a battle. And in terms of uh, uh, knowing how they're gonna react when they face the, the tremendous firepower that modern weaponry would present it, uh, these men were hardly prepared. Uh, the quality of the American militia was, uh, was exceptionally poor. And that was true in the North and that was true in the South. But the early armies of the North and the South will be cobbled together from this militia. Ultimately, and this goes beyond what we're talking about in this lecture today, but ultimately, the, uh, the military of both the North and the South will depend on the creation of volunteer companies. It will depend upon the creation of uh, huge, huge um, numbers of regiments of volunteers who, who come to the flag in 1861 and who come to the flag in 1862. And before this series of lectures is finished, this part two series of lectures are finished, I will show where where that reaches its peak, and then after which there's a real problem getting volunteers. But again, that's for a future lecture. But the brave volunteers, where did those brave volunteers come from? Well, if you remember from the first series of lectures I gave, and I talked about Northern culture, Northern culture was a society of joiners who um, believed in the equality of mankind but practice something quite different. They believed in the equality of mankind, but practice something quite different. And what is the practice that we're talking about? There is a desire, okay, to make distinctions between people. I taught in academia and their instructors and their assistant professors and their associate professors and their full professors and the department chairs and deans and provosts and presidents. And we won't even go beyond that. But do you see a hierarchy there? Do you see different terms by what people are called? Different levels of prestige? And so in Northern society, uh, people proclaimed equality, but they joined clubs, volunteer firemen clubs, um, uh, choirs, dramatic clubs, all kinds of, uh, they, they joined things which today would be the equivalent of Kiwanis and of, uh, of Rotary. And when they did that, people began to be old office. And so a lot of times to distinguish people of merit or at least people of prestige from anybody else, they would take on honorific titles. A lot of people would be called colonel, not because they had any military experience, but because uh, by giving them the honorific title of colonel, it just simply said they have more prestige than anybody else. And this was especially true. It happened in the South, but especially true in the North. And then when it came time to fight, the building blocks of companies and regiments, the building blocks of companies and regiments would become from the Northern society's concept of being a joiners. In the South, basically a little bit different. You have in the South this desire to uh, um, protect their way of life. And so let's kind of look at the difference between the two. Uh, the Northerners uh, kind of blended a sense of religious zeal, which existed in the North, and it was civil religion, which we talked about in previous lectures. 
civil religion is where you blend the values of your, your patriotism and your government and your sense of nationalism with your religious values. And so uh, uh, the North had this, this zeal believing that, that Northern democracy, as they interpreted what democracy was, was God-given. And the South, a region of aristocrats and slaveholders that denied freedom. And so this sense of zeal, look at the Battle Hymn of the Republic, which has this contract with God kind of mentality, which is called Calvinistic contract theology. As Christ died to make men holy, let us die to make men free while God is marching on. See that contract, that power, and thus organizations, civic organizations began to, to form military companies. For example, the volunteer firemen in New York City created several companies uh, who became quite literally known as, as, as volunteer fire departments, but their volunteer fire departments had put away their ladders and put away their pumps to spray water on, on a fire and picked up their rifles and, uh, and began to march. As Christ died to make men holy, they would sing, let us die to make men free. In the South, there was a powerful reaction to that. Now today, neo-Confederates who want to defend the South say, well, you know, most people didn't own slaves. They were fighting to protect their homes because the North was invading. And in one sense, they're correct. But what the neo-Confederates don't point out is that the perception of our homes included a belief that certain people must play a specific role. And among those people who must play a specific role were blacks. And, and blacks were seen as, as slaves. Southern whites, whether they were aristocrats or impoverished, could not perceive of black Americans as anything other than slaves to be controlled, useful in terms of the economy, but also dangerous. Remember that in the Southern white mentality, they were quite familiar with the Haitian rebellions against the French and the slaughter that happened. They were quite familiar with the Second Seminole War, which was as much a slave rebellion as it was an Indian fight to, uh, to, to resist the encroachments upon their ideas and their culture and their land. And so to Southern volunteers, even though you may not own slaves, the idea of the North coming in and radically changing American society was anathema, not to be accepted. It is threatening our homes and our wives and our lifestyle, and not just threatening, it's threatening it with violence and death and and, uh, and destruction. Notice what this young volunteer says. The people of the North have invested the honors of martyrdom upon the wretched John Brown. Remember, Ralph Waldo Emerson, one of the spokesmen for the North said, John Brown has made the gallows glorious like the cross. And so these Southern volunteers are saying, the people of the North have invested the honors of martyrdom on that wretched John Brown whose purpose was to apply flames to our dwellings and weapons of destruction to our lives. And so that's fueling this volunteer sensation across the North, a sense of desperation and fear and protect our homeland. But protecting that homeland also meant that you had to keep society, this very structured articulated society of the South in its proper place. And part of that articulation was the preservation of slavery even if you did not have direct contact with owning slaves. Now, one of the advantages that the South had was that it was a paramilitary society. In other words, it already had companies that could be very quickly changed from the role they were playing in antebellum Southern society into military companies that in turn would make up the regiments that would volunteer to help create an army. And that was in what was called the slave patrol system. The slave patrol system. Every county in the South had a system where every white person, every white male rather, every white male was required to serve X number of days a year 
in what was called the patrol. These would be people who would simply spend their days and nights, usually about a week, uh, maybe every three months, uh, patrolling the neighborhoods and fundamentally looking for all kinds of potential crime. But the main crime they were looking for were Negroes, slaves, who weren't where they were supposed to be, who were running away, or at least were out of pocket, not where they were supposed to be. And that became known as the patrol system. Now, the aristocrats tended to be the officers of the patrol, and, uh, and non-aristocrats tended to be uh, the, uh, the regular members of the patrol. And you say, well, why would people be willing to do that? And the answer is you had to pay taxes. You have to pay taxes. Taxes are one of those things you have to do. But in a society in which money is scarce, one of the ways you can pay your taxes is to engage in work, road work, for example, or more likely in this case, working with the patrol. And by the way, how can you not be in the patrol? Well, that's easy. You paid your fee to exempt you from the patrol. So if you were wealthy enough, you didn't have to have this onerous one, one week out of every three months uh, obligation to patrol because you paid to get out of it. But if you're just a regular old farmer with 160 acres, you or your sons had to be out there every three months patrolling. But this gave the foundation organization for the creation of companies that then were put together to form regiments that began to be the basis ultimately of the Confederate Army uh, during the American crisis of the Civil War. And of course, North and South, as it came to volunteers, uh, there was another factor. And that simply is that these were young men who happened to like young women. And whether young men or young women, they were all caught up in the war fever. And so a young woman would say, I just love a man in uniform. And believe it or not, that became a major factor. This sense of male virility, North and South, I'm not going to, in this time of nation, a grave crisis, I'm going to do my role because I want to look good, look good for my friends. And it's always nice when the sweet young things say, I just love a man in uniform. So how did they puzzle together the armies? This is Major General Irving McDowell, one of the least competent people to fight in the American Civil War and who will be the Union commander at Bull Run. But he said it very nicely. He said, North and South officers had little experience in camp or campaign. They didn't. And commanding officers had rarely supervised more than a few hundred troops. Now, at the time of the American Civil War, Winfield Scott was the highest ranking military officer in the United States Army. The second highest ranking military officer in the United States Army was, uh, was of course, Major General Irving McDowell. And that's why he will be the commander of the Union forces at, uh, at Bull Run. Winfield Scott, by the way, said to Abraham Lincoln, uh, don't put him in charge. He's not competent. And um, Lincoln, having no other choice, really, put him in charge, only to find out that he was not competent. But he was not competent, not simply because of his own failings, but he was not competent because he was leading an army whose officers and whose men were cobbled together militia units so that the professional communication the sharpness of action, the uh, steadfastness under uh, critical situations did not exist among militia in the North or the South to the extent that it would later exist in some of the titanic battles of the American Civil War. Just to give you a quick idea of numbers, look at the size of armies during the Mexican War. In early, in the first battles of the, of the uh, uh, Mexican War, Zachary Taylor had just over 2,000 troops in his entire army. Later, in a, uh, in a second battle, six months later, 
he would have 6,000 in his army. By contrast, Stephen Kearney, who eventually leads the victory that brings California into the American Union, his army was 1,700 as an army. And uh, the only man to command any significant number of troops is, of course, Winfield Scott, who ultimately commanded an army of about 20,000, by far the largest command ever, ever in American history up to that time. Whereas at the first Battle of Bull Run, when two pitiful armies are cobbled together out of state militia, Irving MacDonald will have, MacDowell rather, Irving MacDowell will have 35,000 troops under his command. But these are 35,000 troops that he doesn't really have command of. It's simply raw material that's thrown together. And the same thing will be true of the Confederate States of America. The total number of Confederates fighting in that battle was 32,000. But again, 32,000 raw, un largely untrained, unbloodied militia. Well, let's look at uh, uh, what's going on here. How were these armies trained? How were they pulled together? Well, they were trained and pulled together on the basis of states. Each state governor, north and south, was given a quota that that state was to fulfill. And it was the responsibility of that state governor to select the colonels and brigadier generals. They were appointed by the state government who commanded the regiments. And each regiment was formed about, in theory, a thousand men. But by the time disease and other things happened, a typical regiment in the Confederate Army and the Union Army both uh, was actually as low as 300, uh, very rarely more than 400 men, even though the paper strength of a regiment was a thousand. And um, these men would elect their officers and elect the non-commissioned officers, which again means that you're elected on the basis of popularity, not on the basis of skill, because neither the officers or the men had much skill. The best they could do is line up and parade. That's all the training they ever had on those court days. So they had to drill and drill and drill, but, but what do you do in drill? And the answer is that prior to the American Civil War, you have a man by the name of William Joseph Hardy from Georgia, aristocrat, um, who was with part of the American military. And he creates what's known as Hardy's Tactics. It actually has a longer title, um, in the publication of Rifle and Light Infantry Tactics for the Exercise and Maneuvering of Troops when Acting as Light Infantry or Rifleman, published in 1855. Aren't you glad you don't have to memorize that? But um, he was a star graduate of, of West Point, class of 38. He was selected because of his brilliance to, to go to France and study tactics because the French were actually developing the best tactics in the world at that time. Uh, the French execution of tactics, that's a different issue, but they were developing the best tactics of the world at that time. And then after studying in France, he returns to the United States, goes to West Point where he is the instructor of tactics. But when the war came, there were not enough people who were trained in tactics. And so what you ended up with these brigadiers and colonels and elected officers is that they literally would go out in the drill field with their men and they would have in one hand his book and on the other hand try to get these soldiers to act in unison to learn how to march and maneuver and change positions upon command to hear commands given by drum and bugle and other sources and to act like a unified army eventually they will succeed but they eventually will take a couple of years. And the Battle of Bull Run is fought roughly 90 days after Fort Sumter. So the people who were fighting Bull Run have not been adequately drilled. They had the drill they had in, in county court days, and that's about it. I'm not going to read all of this, but it's here for your information. Um, here are just some idea. Imagine, if you will, in your left hand, you, you, it's open to Hardy's tactics. And now you're trying to drill, say, 10 or 15 or 20 men, and you have to literally 
read what he says do, and then command your soldiers to do it. And uh, here's a simple five-step thing. How to commence arms, load your weapon, prime your weapon, aim your weapon, and then fire. And when I send these, this out as a PDF, you can read of this, but you see how complicated it is. And this is just one of the elements of, of, of how you gotta learn in terms of drill. So they become second nature to you. And by the time you get to the first battle of Bull Run, uh, the troops have not been adequately drilled to be able to do in unison all the kinds of things that a Civil War era army has to do. Which leads us to that first important battle, the Battle of Bull Run, 21 July, 1861. Um, impatience or hysteria. The, the belief that we can fight a couple of quick battles and the thin veneer of, of secession, the thin veneer of, of treason, if you will, uh, will be put away and the South will retreat. And, um, and then we can go through the process of trying to heal the nation, punish those who are guilty and, uh, and, and bring about some kind of reconciliation. Harper's Weekly, July 13th, 1861. All it's going to take is a, a quick double step onto Richmond and the Confederates uh, already drunk on their whiskey are going to, to retreat and to flee. And of course, again, booming the drum, no concession with traitors. That's what uh, Horace Greeley is saying. And down in Washington, Horace Greeley had a, a very important um, uh, reporter, agent for, his, for him. And he was reporting that the military force that had uh, descended around Richmond, because that's where you're sending most of your militia. Uh, I said Richmond, Washington, D.C. The militia are going to protect Washington, D.C. This is the man covering Washington, D.C. And he made it seem as if uh, the power of the American military was uh, overwhelming. Certainly, there was a lot of soldiers showing up. But these are very green soldiers. And he's beating that drum which is being repeated in the New York Tribune. On to Richmond, says this reporter for uh, the, the New York Tribune. Point your standards and your steel toward this weird city, uh, sister, who has said and sung incantations of treason for 25 years. We do beg and implore you to pierce the vitals of Virginia and scour the serpent seed of her rebellion on the crowning heights of Richmond. We're building up this spirit of, of uh, Let's get this thing over with. Let's do it now. We've got the military and it's strong and it's powerful and it's numerous. Let's destroy this rebellion, get rid of this cancer as quickly as possible. That's the idea that was building. Well, the two armies meet at Bull Run and it's a simple battle. Most Civil War battles are simple. Two sides face each other and they march until they fight there's a gradual retreat one way or the other. Something might happen, a flanking attack that changes things. And that's what happens at the Battle of Bull Run. Initially, on the early morning of 21 July, 1861, a Union army of about 35,000 collides with a Confederate army under P.G. Beauregard, um, uh, who has success early in the war and then fades from importance. But Beauregard has... Uh, an army of 20,000. And because the Union Army is larger, he gradually begins to push Beauregard back about a couple of miles until about mid afternoon, uh, Joseph E. Johnston, who outranks Beauregard. So when Johnston gets on the field, he becomes the commander in place. But uh, Joseph E. Johnston arrives, first time that railroads are used to bring in significant reinforcements. And Johnston's army of 12,000 brings 12,000 fresh Confederate troops on the field that includes Thomas Jackson, Thomas Jackson, later be known as Stonewall Jackson, and another general of Alabama troops by the name of B, who we'll talk about in just a second. But these two men helped to form a line along the top of a small hill called Henry Hill. And as the 
armies are being pressed, as the Union Army is having success pressing on the Confederate Army, the Confederate Army is about to break, the arrival of Jackson and Bee, along with other members of Johnson's command, stabilizes the Confederate situation. But Bee is frustrated. Bree's Alabamians are, are, are falling like flies. And um, uh, he sees Stonewall Jackson at the top of the hill, and Joan Stonewall Jackson is not moving. His soldiers are, are sitting there on top of the hill and not moving. And so what happens is a little controversial. But he makes a statement, and it might be a positive statement. There stands Jackson like a stone wall, rally behind the Virginians. Or it might be a curse. There stands Jackson like a stone wall when we need him down here fighting with us. And we'll never know which way he meant. But there stands Jackson like a stone wall, is his statement. And shortly after that, B is shot in the stomach. He's incapacitated and he will die the next day, never having explained exactly the intonation what he meant. But that becomes the foundation of Thomas Stonewall Jackson becoming the famous name of that particular general. And Stonewall Jackson did make a difference. He was well-trained, he was a man of steel and of talent, and he knew that if he kept his troops on the top and then he had artillery that could be brought up very quickly from a hidden position, fire their guns right into the Union Army, and then the guns would fall backwards a short distance below the hill, be safely reloaded and back up to the front. And sure enough, the cannon fire firing into, at roughly four o'clock in the afternoon, firing into the Union lines, broke the spirit of those green troops that were Union, fighting the green troops that were Confederate. The Union troops spirit was broken, and all of a sudden you had a panic. And in that panic, one of only two panics that ever occurred during the American, entire American Civil War, in this case it was the Union Army that panicked, later after the Battle of Nashville it would be the Confederate Army, but um, uh, you have this panic, and it's a total defeat for the Union. That on to Richmond, we're just going to attack and destroy the thin veneer, well, it turned out not to be true. In terms of numbers of casualties, I've just given you simply the number killed, and they don't look all that high. 481 for the Union, 387 for the Confederates. Well, those are by standards of the American Civil War later, insignificant numbers. But by the standards of what had ever happened in any battle in the American history, this was an overwhelming number of people killed in a single battle. It shook to the core people living in the North. It shook to the core people living in the South. Now, why didn't the Confederate Army pursue and capture Washington, D.C.? For the same reason that General McDowell's army collapsed. They were green troops. Joseph E. Johnston, a highly competent commander who will fight the entire Civil War as one of the major leaders of the Confederacy, uh, could not rally his green troops to do what any professional army would do, which is to, to pursue a panicked army to ultimate victory. And uh, so what you have is just two armies that are cobbled together with green troops fighting a slugfest rather than a real battle, and it comes to an end. Now, in that coming to an end, heads had to roll. One of the heads that rolled was Winfield Scott. He was elderly. Lincoln, one of the few times during the Civil War that he truly was angry, he went to Winfield Scott and blessed him out. Just, just really, even though Winfield Scott had said ahead of time to Lincoln, we cannot fight this battle, the troops are too green, it didn't matter. Lincoln just had him out. And Lincoln never again paid much attention to Winfield Scott. So much so that in October of 1861, this great man, full of pompousness, he was called Old Fuss and Fetters, but full of pride, who had given 50 plus years of his life to the military and was considered one of the most world respected people in the military, realized that his advice was no longer welcomed in the Lincoln administration. And he quietly 
and without fanfare, resigned. On the other hand, Irving McDowell was still left in the Eastern Theater, but his command, he was, he was basically, uh, others were appointed to, to be over him. And among those appointed to be over him was General George B. McClellan, who's gonna play a major role in the Civil War and to create the Army of the Potomac. And that's for a future lecture. As for McDowell, what happens to him when he demonstrated in a couple of more battles and campaigns that he was just not that bright and not that competent. Well, you can't fire somebody for just not being bright. So he was given a major and important command. He was sent to the Department of California where there was next to nothing to do. And he was able to engage in his personal hobby of landscaping, quite literally landscaping and making the military basis in California look really sharp, really sharp. Coda. What we've learned is that you cannot fight a war with amateurs. Linfield Scott was the man who had tried to make that message clear. And that message did come clear, even though, because it happened on his watch, he had to pay the price, rather than Abraham Lincoln paying the price. He resigned in October. He went on a long vacation with his daughter and her daughter's husband to France. He spoke fluent, fluent French. Oddly enough, in France, even though he was a civilian, he was consulted a couple of times by the French government and made some recommendations that helped to keep the French and to some extent the British from immediately recognizing the Confederacy but he did that as a civilian. Uh, when he returned to the United States in 1862, he is elderly, his health is uh, not the best. He weighs over 300 pounds. And uh, not only that, but, but he's 70 some odd years old. He, his health is declining. Um, Lincoln actually visits him in his apartments at West Point briefly in 1862 and plays him, pays him some honor. He wrote his memoirs, which I've read, and they're almost incomprehensible. And then he lives with his mind still active to see Union success in, in the American Civil War. And he died May 29, 1866, one of America's greatest soldiers. He doesn't quite ever receive the accolades that he should have gotten. Well, I hope that's been interesting. Next week, we're gonna look at personalities and places and other important things. But now this lecture is complete and we have time for a few questions. Okay. Bishop, can you get everybody up and going or, or Shelby, whichever it is? Sorry, it took me a minute to get it to unmute. My computer is slow today. <laughs> Well, I'm having technical problems myself, but not with my computer. My very expensive TV is kaput, and I'm not happy with that. Okay. Oh. <laughs> so uh, if anybody has any questions, we've got time, and uh, I will open the floor for that. Uh, you can raise your hand or ask them in chat. Yeah, I do. Oh, okay. Max? Yeah. Uh, I might be jumping ahead in this. Fred, but uh, for years, uh, I have wondered ab about why this particular thing happened, why this was said. When Lincoln was assassinated by Booth, the story goes that uh, as he jumped down on the stage from the box uh, seat, uh, he turned to the audience and yelled a Latin phrase, which means basically, uh, this is what happens to tyrants. And then he turned and ran off and uh, the rest of it is history. And I wondered for years and years why Booth thought he was a tyrant. Well, in, in view of, of what we've talked about, uh, suspension of rights and uh, all the things that Lincoln felt he had to do to preserve the union, is this what Booth was referring to? Absolutely. It, um, where should I go with this? Uh, roughly uh, what Booth 
yelled. He, he jumped 12 or 14 feet from booths, uh, from uh, the presidential balcony onto the stage. And this is where he broke his ankle yeah. and, uh, and, and led to his demise ultimately. But, uh, but he stands, he's an actor, he's very dramatic and he raises yeah. uh, his knife, which he had used to, uh, to fend off a, a union officer that had tried to subdue him. And he, he slashed the union officer and the officer had to fall back because he was severely injured. And, um, uh, and he yelled, sick semper terrenus, which uh, is the state slogan of Virginia, which basically <laughs> says, uh, uh, such is what happens to all tyrants. Now, why the state has that is a, uh, I don't know, but that's, that's the state slogan of Virginia. I mean, California state slogan is Eureka. I mean, who knows <laughs> who understand these things. Yeah. I don't even know what the state slogan of Texas is, but I've got a few ideas. But anyway, um, look at today. Uh, our current president has a tremendous number of people who believe that, uh, uh, that he's the greatest thing ever happened to this country. Okay, I've, I've just traveled across uh, Arkansas, Tennessee, and Missouri, all of which are, are very powerful Trump areas, and I see nothing but, but Trump signs. But if I'm to believe the news, uh, there's other parts of the country that aren't as enthused. But look at his enemies. They call him um, a traitor. They call him uh, mentally incompetent. Uh, they call him a fascist. They call him a Nazi. Okay, they, 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 these are terms that are currently being used toward the president of the United States. And today, the Speaker of the House of Representatives um, has said that she's gonna use uh, the, I think it's the 25th Amendment to the Constitution, maybe it's 23rd, I, Got to double check because I'm doing this off the top of my head. Uh, but it's the amendment whereby a president can be removed if he is mentally incompetent. That is to say, he's had a stroke, or you can prove that he is no longer competent to rule. Yeah. I mean, I can see Nancy Pelosi jumping on the stage, lifting her knife, and shouting, This is what happens to tyrants. Now, I'm not saying whether or not you should support Pelosi or you support Trump. But if you kind of get the sense of the feelings that exist in this country today, you can understand the intensity of feeling that John Wilkes Booth would have had. Uh, Booth saw Lincoln as the ultimate expression of the destruction of virtue, okay? And the virtue he saw destroyed was that orderly, structured Southern society in which in his mind, and in the mind of a lot of other white Southerners, that dangerous class of human beings who were called African-Americans or really called Negroes, and that's the way they thought of it, um, are, are made useful by keeping them in the, in the very tight regulatory situation of slavery, and at the same time, unable to be the savages that they believed that blacks would be. So that Lincoln's freeing of blacks was in essence in their minds of people like Booth and people like so many other white Southerners um, uh, turning loose the country to anarchy. And that's why there was such tremendous hatred of Abraham Lincoln. And uh, uh, yes, Lee, uh, Booth, Booth saw Lincoln as, as an absolute tyrant and, uh, and worthy of, of being kidnapped. And then later, of course, the. Uh, worthy of being assassinated and removed. And uh, uh, since we today, myself included, see Lincoln as a virtuous savior of the country and perhaps the best president we've ever had, uh, it's hard for us sometimes to imagine that other people saw him the way William Booth, I said William, yeah, yeah Booth, Booth uh, believed him to be. Okay, other questions or thoughts? Do you remember what I said about emotion? And emotion, how important emotion is to, to history? When people's emotions get to that kind of white hot level, 
look what happens. Somewhere between six and 700,000 people died. Okay, six, I mean, are you in the mood to kill anybody today? I'm pretty well not, okay? Kind of want to kill the people that put together my TV that I spent a lot of money <laughs> on working, but, uh, but I don't think I'm gonna get that opportunity. But uh, in all truth, it became normal for people to slaughter other people to the number of between six and 700,000 between 1861 and 1865. That takes a tremendous amount of emotion. Okay, I think James Lindley has a question or a comment. Okay, James. Yeah, I, my question, yes, thank you. I really appreciate uh, all the work you've put to, into these, this lecture. Um, and I guess my question, and it's really, appreciate what you're saying and, and uh, the way, uh, the thinking of the people of the time. I, I suspect kind of thinking about what you've said, the concept that we're gonna go out and shoot somebody um, that it was it was not they weren't thinking of it in the graphic terms that it became Correct. in this early stage it was we're 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 a club we're the firemen and mm -hmm. we're gonna all of our drinking buddies we're gonna all grab up our guns and we're gonna go sing songs and march around with our guns and we're gonna go off to war not thinking what that actually meant that's correct that uh it's, I, let me, let me use the analogy of a marriage, William. Uh, two people, 121, 120, I happen to be familiar with that concept, uh, get married. And they have a concept of what marriage is like. 47 years later, when that marriage comes to an end because my wife died, I can look back on that marriage and realize that while we had a good beginning and we stayed faithful and loyal to one another, uh, we had no concept, no concept of um, the good and the bad and the struggles and the successes and the failures and the, all the kinds of things that will happen over the course of nearly half a century. And uh, so if you can kind of put yourself in the mind of, of two young people who, who fall in love with one another and who have this this image of, of, of going through life in, in, in a sense of, yeah, we know that, you know, it's going to be the long haul and all that, but we can do it. But what it really takes to do it, what kind of commitment is necessary to do it? A commitment that's not just love, it's a commitment of money and of energy and of compromise and of all those kinds of things. And that's just one institution, that's marriage. But now you're going to fight a civil war. And the idea, looking at it from the viewpoint of the North, and there was a similar kind of attitude in the South, but from the viewpoint of the North, um, secession is a veneer. You know, uh, it looks rough on the top, but there's nothing underneath it. All we got to do is take the shovel and, and hit the secessionists in the face, and they'll come to their senses. And, and that was the view. On to Richmond. On to Richmond. But it didn't happen. It took a lot of attitude change and a lot of commitment from both the North and the South to prosecute that war over the next four years. And, um, and we come out of it at the other end, a much more mature people, uh, a, a much stronger people, much uh, more knowledgeable people, but a very scarred people. And as I look at my own life and everybody in here can look at their own lives, uh, the innocence I had at the age of 20 and 21 uh, is not the multi-scarred person that I am today where I can look back on successes and failures and know what it took to, to, to get to be, um, you know, someone who's looking at the, uh, at, at the shadow end of his life. But, uh, but it wasn't that simple, easy path that I envisioned uh, or simplistic path, I guess is a better way of putting that I envisioned back when I was 20, 21 years old. One of the other things that has always 
been interesting to me as I, I live in Fredericksburg. Okay. Fort Mason is just up the way from me. And, mm -hmm. and you look at the numbers of, of men who served at Fort Mason that became generals on both sides. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's always been, I, I've always thought about, well, why in the world did these people get sent out here to these, um, you know, the forts that were along the frontier back mm -hmm. in the pre-Civil War time, of course. And, yeah. and as I kind of thought about it, it was somebody was thinking these guys needed some battlefield experience for what was to come. I think you're essentially right. But uh, if, if I could kind of smooth a little bit what you're saying. Uh, sometimes people's success in life or fate might be a better way of putting it just simply has to be with uh, uh, what's happening and what your background is. Uh, let me give you a personal example. 1993-94, I actually, I'm sorry, yeah, 93-94, I spent a year in the People's Republic of China working for Johns Hopkins University. Now, I'm not um, at the top of my field. In fact, at that time, I was just beginning to develop a minor reputation in my field. But the deal was Johns Hopkins University needed somebody that specialized in historiography to spend a year in China. And I specialized in historiography, which is the study of the writing of history. And it's very rare for a historian to be, to be interested in that. In other words, there are roughly 20,000 professional historians in the United States. The number of historians who actually have any kind of specialty in historiography is less than a dozen. And the number of, that have an interest in historiography that are willing to take a year out of their lives and go to China was one. That's how I got the job. You see my point? And, and by the way, we yes. time, I, I, I couldn't figure out why they wanted his uh, historiographer. I got there and found out why, which was pretty scary for a guy that was barely mid-career to realize that I was trying to teach the Chinese how to do history because, well, for good reason, there weren't any historians in China anymore. Most of them had been executed, quite literally. Right. Um, now, now, having said that, uh, uh, why did I get that position? Because I was at the top of my field? Not hardly. I would, had a few publications, but very few at the time, but in the right direction for that, that chore. That's what happened to men who were serving out at Mason or serving at Fort Phantom just outside of Abilene or serving at um, uh, any number of the frontier, antebellum frontier forts. They had military experience they were officers, and all of a sudden, state governors, north and south, needed to have generals and brigadiers and an experienced officer, especially an experienced West Point officer, were, were, were precious diamonds, no matter how crude or how rough or how untalented the men might be. And so you have these officers in this isolated place called West Texas, and Mason would be that, or, or Fort Phantom, who now, because they've had military experience, their careers are gonna shoot right to the top because even though their experience is pretty shallow, it's better than anybody else's. And some of these men, one of them was named Ulysses S. Grant, actually shoots to the very top because he was this nugget, not very well respected, that turned out to be brilliant. Some of the more supposedly brilliant ones, like Braxton Bragg, turn out to be a disaster, okay? But they both shoot to the top because there are just not very many people of experience that uh, they can fit in right at the time when you need somebody somewhere and you're grabbing anybody you can. Does that help make, make sense to you? Yes, it does. How many, about how many people were graduating from West Point at that time. What was the class size? Um, I, I can't give you a number uh, somewhere. I know, I know. for example, uh, one officer I'm thinking of right now graduated toward the bottom of his class and he was 45th, okay? 
So that tells me that roughly about 50 officers a year were graduating from West Point. Uh, something you need to know about West Point, it goes back to, to Thomas Jefferson. Now Jefferson was a man to be respected, a man of ideas that was incredible. But when it came to, uh, to, to the practical elements of government, uh, this country is lucky to have survived his administration and the administration of James Madison. That's all there is to it. We were lucky to have survived that. We almost didn't because they brought on the War of 1812 and we were stomped on by the British, making it very much a second effort to do it. But having said that, Jefferson's idea was that West Point wouldn't even teach military tactics. West Point was a college that taught engineering, how to build a fort, how to fire an artillery piece. It didn't teach tactics until 1840s. It certainly didn't teach the kind of tactics necessary to, to plan out um, uh, huge campaigns such as the Anaconda Plan. In fact, Winfield Scott, arguably one of the most successful leaders of the American military that ever existed, had no officers training. He didn't go to West Point, but he becomes one of the, the greatest military yes. leaders. His personality was pretty bad. Uh, you talk about a, a guy you didn't want to argue with because he had a, a way of just putting you down, not listening to you. But, uh, but his brilliance can't not be denied. Uh, West Point was not turning out the kind of leaders necessary to, uh, to fight the kind of war we fought. So what you had was a, a fundamentally officers, even the best of them, who had military training, but the ones who rose to the top ultimately were the ones who had the natural talent to put it all together. Robert E. Lee had the natural talent to put it all together. Joseph E. Johnston had the natural talent to put it all together. Ulysses S. Grant and Sherman, neither of whom were very well respected at the opening of the war, had the military talent to put the whole thing together. Where in the course of all of this were the guys that had the logistics kind of thinking that allowed them to begin to figure out how to marshal the equipment and stuff that you need to fight a battle? Where were they? Okay, beautiful question. I just wanna mention that uh, because you've hit on the key word, logistics. Um, just to very quickly review, um, armchair generals, look at tactics, how a battle is fought. Um, college professors tend to look at strategy, you know, the doctrine of, of, of where you're moving your armies. The people who understand warfare and how wars are fought, they focus on logistics. And to that end, the South suffered. It, it developed a logistics system, uh, but it was, inferior to the logistic system that, uh, that existed in the North. The North had two people who understood logistics brilliantly. One was a fellow that, that uh, actually served very well once you got him in the right position, and by the name of General Halleck, and we're gonna talk about him next week. Uh, he understood logistics and he would be put in charge of, initially he'd be put in charge of the whole military where he was a failure. But, uh, but he, his position would be eventually kind of maneuvered in such a way that he became in charge of overall logistics for the entire Northern military. And in that area, he performed brilliantly. And he's what kept the Northern armies well supplied, whereas the Confederate armies often had to just throw stuff together. The other person who had logistical background was a survivor of the uh, war with Mexico, a, a very insignificant officer who played a very minor role in the war with Mexico. He was a captain, uh, but he was a captain of uh, quartermaster corps. Now he did a couple of brave things during the war for which he later will become famous, but his real job during the Mexican war was logistics, being a quartermaster. His name was Ulysses S. Grant. 
And when Grant rose to command, Grant, more than anyone else, knew that if his armies were to be successful, he had to have supply lines, he had to have natural avenues of uh, uh, logistics, and uh, he was brilliant. And he could also see where logistics weren't going to happen. In 1864, future lecture, uh, you have something called the Arkansas Campaign plus the Red River Campaign. You have Banks moving up the Red River, who's a Union general, and then to meet Banks, roughly where Texarkana is, coming from Little Rock, was Union General Steele. Grant said, don't do that. Don't send those men out there. The logistics to support those armies doesn't exist. Now, Lincoln, for reasons of international diplomacy, mainly the French being down in Mexico and we wanted to get them out and show pressure, he needed to have the Union Army move into Texas to put pressure on the French. See how all this sort of fits together, but it's outside of what we think of the Civil War. So Lincoln overruled Grant, who said, don't do it, the logistics aren't there. And guess who was right? Ulysses S. Grant. Banks Grant. Mm -hmm. defeated because he didn't have the logistics. And Steele, from, uh, coming out of Arkansas, was defeated because he didn't have the logistics. So the North had people who had a better sense of logistics, but logistics isn't glamour. That's why Grant comes out of the Mexican War without very much glamour, because he was a quartermaster corps guy. But he came to understand bullets and bandages and bayonets, and that's important. And beans. Oh, beans. Yeah, I forgot the beans. Yeah, that, that, I knew there were three Bs, but I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't remember what they were. So you, you got me on that one. Yeah, it's beans, uh, it's beans, bullets, and uh, and bandages. That's that's the term. Bayonets. Well, I mean, I, it, it was a B, so I just pulled it out. <laughs> no, it's, it's beans, bullets, and bayonets. <laughs> That's, that's, those are the three terms. Yeah. All right. Well, I think we are out of time. If anybody has any other questions, you can email them to me and I'll forward them to, to Fred. Or if you have his email, you can, you can ask him. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming. It was amazing. I'm, I'm getting really excited for the next one because we're well, getting the into the battles. Yeah, well, the next one actually is going to uh, be an explanation of people and places and terms that, uh, again, everybody, you, you'll get a sense. I'm going to make an assessment of uh, who was believed to be good and ultimately faltered, who was not even paid attention to and succeeded, and then some who were believed to be good and succeeded, and some were believed to be good and failed miserably. And, uh, and we're going to focus on the 1861, early 1862 period to pull out these personalities. That's the people, the places. I'm going to describe how you have three general uh, land areas, the Eastern Theater, the so-called Trans-Appalachian Theater or Western Theater, and then the Trans-Mississippi Theater to the further west, plus a fourth theater, which is the, uh, which is the oceans. And... Um, and a few other things that are, are critical to understanding the war. And then in the last lecture of this series, uh, we're going to look at uh, what finally develops into the early real armies of the war that lead to Shiloh and to the Seven Days Battle in uh, the Richmond area and completely change everybody's concept of war and the ramifications of it. So I look forward to sharing the future. Thank you all. It's been thank fun you, for me Fred. to put this together. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank yes, you. Have a great day.